Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Smoke here in New York City. In 1991, jazz vocalist Vanessa Rubin recorded an album that took the jazz world in New York City by storm called Soul Eyes. And in her 25 years, she has paid tribute and homage to some of the great luminaries of the female jazz vocalists, including Carmen McRae to Billie Holiday. Her latest CD, which features saxophonist Don Brady is called Full Circle, in which she really dives into her origins going back home to Cleveland, Ohio with the Jazz Organ Quartet. Tonight, she's performing selections off Full Circle as well as performing with the Joe Farnsworth Quartet. And tonight, they're paying tribute to another great jazz luminary, legendary producer, composer, as well as pianist Tad Dameron. I sat down earlier with Vanessa and we talked about the latest recording Full Circle. We talked about what she's brought to jazz over the last 25 years as well as what she's teaching some of her upcoming students as far as the idiom of jazz and jazz vocal. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Miss Vanessa Rubin with the Joe Farnsworth Quartet live here at Smoke here in New York City. Everybody know what the one is on that. <laughs> Advice is cheap and fate is sometimes unkind. Nevertheless, accept this free pearl of wisdom offered to the rings of wisdom. If you're into tempting fate, then it's good fate. Fish gotta swim. And like the final song says, birds gotta fly. But if you can't help loving someone till you die, don't start by living a lie. Avoid the second rate by starting with Congratulations, dear. Full Circle is really your full circle back to where you started, and it features Don Braden as well as the organ quartet. Yeah, Full Circle represents uh, Don and I coming back together after many years of kind of going in a lot of different directions and and playing together occasionally on the road and gigs and festivals, but we never got a chance to really record and do a project together. Um, so after uh, doing some very early gigs together in New York when we first arrived, we decided that we should come back and do something together. And Oregon represents definitely uh, where I started in Cleveland uh, with the Blackshaw Brothers with Cecil Rutger. So doing an organ record, and this is my first organ record, is uh, really nice. So full circle with John Braden, full circle with Oregon. Tell me about the songs that you chose for this. What made you decide to record the songs for this project? Uh, there are songs that I've kind of been doing that I, uh, on li live gigs, uh, two of them are originals that of course I'd like to get out there for people to uh, enjoy and hopefully maybe somebody else might decide they want to record them. Um, Don has some, has some originals on there, so it's the Great American Songbook mixed up with some originals, but all of it's grooving and all of it's swinging. And of course there's some Dameron tunes on there, and anybody that knows me knows I've been uh, an advocate of the Dameron Songbook for a number of years now, so I get a chance to preview a couple of those melodies as well. Vanessa, you know the organ trio and the organ quartet for anybody adds a whole nother dynamic to jazz and blues and even gospel to yeah, a certain degree. Yeah. What is it about the organ that you really, really like? And what is it about it to the origin and the idiom of the music that people in the tradition keep using it? Well, um, 
In the words of a friend of mine who's a really great jazz drummer, Mr. Greg Bandy, he described it as a big, fat, juicy piano. And I like it because it has such a full sound and a driving bass. And I like that because I connect with that very well. And uh, once you get that, and then you dress it up with some good drums and a guitar player, you've got like a big band, and I like full sound. Yeah. Some of the great jazz female vocalists, Dinah Washington, Sarah Vaughn, Car Carmen McRae, they dived into to the, to the jazz organ trio or some kind of quartet. Moving forward, do you think that people have forgotten a lot about the jazz organ? Um, I don't think they have forgotten about it. I just think that it's not available for them to really uh, hear a lot because there was a time when jazz, when organ was very popular and you had a lot of rooms with organ in it and therefore there was an opportunity for jazz uh, ensembles to exist. Uh, but when they started uh, taking the organ out of the clubs then there was not an opportunity for a lot of organ players to play and for jazz uh, uh, groups with organ to exist. Um, hence, uh, you know, a lot of uh, jazz uh, companies uh, have made portable like organs, you know, small organs that sound very, very good. And so people who are really adamant about playing organ, who are just basically real organ players, uh, when they can't get a B3, they bring out that portable stuff, and I got to tell you, some of it sounds really good. Vanessa, you took part in a wonderful set over the weekend, paying tribute to a great person from your hometown, mm. composer, pianist, and a great luminary of the music, Tad Damron. Yes. What is it about his music that you're bringing light to today's listeners, as well as why is he so important to the jazz? Tad Damron was a architect in the bebop era of that music. But Tad was like one of those behind the scene kind of cats. He wasn't a soloist. But Tad could write and Tad could arrange and he was a wonderful pianist. But people recognized his genius in his composition. What he could do with all the new stuff that people were doing with bebop. All the new chords and inversions and things like that. And he used those things to create beautiful compositions and melody within the bebop music okay so you got a lot of soloists and they playing and then and, 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 and they going through all of the changes but on top of that tag could write a beautiful melody with those same kind of chord changes melodies that we would love and remember uh, so he was so good at taking a small because of his understanding of that era and that music and what they were doing with it when the big bands broke down and the small groups came into being, Tad knew how to take that harmony and make a big sound out of a small number of instruments. And that's why people really dug him, you know, because he just could do that. And that's a special kind of person.
but his melodies, his writing. He's an unsung hero, you know. People forget about the people behind the scenes, you know. Uh, 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 Fast Navarro was bad, but look at who he had creating that musical bed. Miles was bad, but look at who he had in his band. He could just get up there and just do his thing because the foundation was strong and, and, you know, it was just a good musical marriage. And Tad made good musical marriages for a lot of people. He wrote for Carmen. He did stuff for Decca Records. He wrote for Sarah. He arranged for Eckstein. He arranged for Dizzy. He arranged for a lot of big bands in Kansas City. You know, he came, he met Bird and came to New York. I mean, he died too soon. 48, 1965. If he had not died, what might he have continued to contribute that today we would all continue to be, you know, playing and talking about, which is why I want people to know about him because uh, we can never forget about the people behind the scenes or that seemingly are behind the scenes. Because we can like me, I'm a singer, but hey, I love a great trio. And I give my bands a lot of credit because I can sing and I'm, you know, things the way I want to if I know my trio got my back and they're inspiring me and they're giving me a lot of information uh, you know with which to work with every night you know notes and chords and rhythms and emotion and you know it's all a hodgepodge but I don't do it by myself and with an electrifying sweet surprise You, you know, how did you get acclimated or get exposed to jazz music? Jazz music was played in my uh, home a lot on records when I was a young girl, so I grew up listening to it. Uh, no one ever told me it was jazz, it was just music, and I learned to listen without categories. So, you know, it was in me from a child. Can you recall the very first song that you sang as a child? No. Cause I sung all the time, but I used to sing. I tell you one little funny story. Uh, my brother, an elder brother of mine, used to play uh, Lambert Hendrix and Ross a lot. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the uh, songs used to be Cloud Burst that I remember hearing. And I remember getting my hair braided to Cloud Burst. And one of the things that was fun for me to do was to walk to school and try to sing it. So you know, I was blue and I was always wearing a frown. Until my love had turned me down. Well, that was good till you got to the hey baby, I'm gonna tell you about your love and then you're hugging and you kissing your sweet little little baby. You know that part? Woo! 
knew that was always a challenge, but it was always so much fun. I didn't know it was jazz and it was swinging, but it was just fun. And um, I remember that as part of my childhood. I'll never forget John Hendrix singing Cloudburst and Give Me That Wine and all those other fun, you know, pieces on that CD, on that LP. <laughs> So growing up, you pretty much had a hodgepodge of soul music and also jazz music and popular music. And Caribbean music. My mother's from Trinidad. So it was a melting pot of music in my home. You know, we had jazz. We had R&B. Cleveland is three hours from Detroit. And, you know, I'm the seventh of eight children, so we used to listen. You know, we had 45s, and we had blue light in the basement parties, and we was like James Brown. and. You know, Diana Ross and the Supremes and the Temptations and, you know, whoever the popular people were. And then the, old, the next generation, you know, they was listening to Cannonball and Nancy and, you know, Lambert Hendricks and Ross and uh, my man on trumpet from um, mm, Swift, Swift as the Wind. Can't think of his name right now, this trumpet player. Anyway, and then my daddy's stuff was like uh, Count Basie and Gene Ammons. And so it was just a lot of stuff. And then there were like private music lessons. My mother had my uh, brother take drum lessons. I was taking piano. I played a little flute in school. I mean, it was always a very artistic environment, very cultured environment. Vanessa, I understand that you took part in a competition and you paid homage to one of your influences, which is Billie Holiday. And I think it was this particular contest where you decided that you were going to do music full time. Yeah, I don't think it was really about Billie Holiday at the time as much as it was about God Bless the Child. Because I really didn't know that to be a signature song of hers at that time, but I knew it to be a standard and something that I don't know how I got to that song, but I did it at a uh, Miss Black Central Ohio pageant in college and, you know, won a little talent competition and with a really fabulous, what's most important is the guy that played, um, Bobby, oh man, I'm going to get back to his name. He lives in Columbus and he plays organ and he is phenomenal and he played piano too. And um, uh, the lights came on at that performance because I really wasn't that serious. I was always a vocal child, my mother would say. and. Uh, so I could always sing a little bit, but I had never considered singing as a profession. My parents uh, promoted academia, and I was supposed to go to law school or medicine, you know, be a doctor or something like that. So you can imagine after graduating from journalism school and coming home and saying, "I'm going to be, a, I want to be a jazz singer," that didn't go over too well. <laughs> That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Smoke here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the talented Miss Vanessa Rubin for her time, as well as the Joe Farnsworth Quartet, as well as the staff and management here at Smoke. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column, as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Keep it in mind. Advice is cheap and pain is sometimes unkind. Nevertheless, accept this free pearl of wisdom offered to the reins of wisdom. If you're into tempting fate, then it's good bait. Fish gotta swim. And like the final song says, birds gotta fly. But if you can't help loving someone till you die, don't stop by to live a lie. Avoid the second rate by starting with Show. The morals, ain't no to pain.